composing the body and mind in the present, the one point here and now, the still point, just reflecting that it's the here and now, the Pachubana Dhamma. Pachubana is the word for the present, the here and now Dhamma. The past is a memory. Yesterday, okay, well, ask yourself, what's yesterday? What happened to yesterday? And then it's a memory. We can remember things. Now, that's all that's left is a memory. My whole life is just, I can remember things. I can't remember every thing that happened. Very few things, but they have certain memories. And they always arise in the present. I can't go back and live in the past. I can go back and uh, hold on to memories of the past. But in the reality of this here and now Dhamma is that memory arises, ceases. I did this in the past. I, I was a student at Berkeley. I was uh, in the U.S. Navy. I was in the Peace Corps. I was in Thailand. I was a disciple of Ajahn Chah. These are perceptions based on memory. I mean, so your whole, you know, your whole autobiography, when you really examine it, is nothing. There's no self. There's this, you know, one, one loves, it. these days people love to write their autobiographies. Every, everybody, every dreary mind wants to tell everybody about their life. But in terms of reflecting the way it is, I mean, this Buddha knowing the Dhamma is, you can see this, the past is a memory in the present. It's not, it's not a dismissing memory or the past and say it doesn't matter or it's not a rejection, but it's just a noticing, a noting the way it really is. Because a lot of a lot of people are very attached to their past, what they've accomplished, the the things that they've accomplished, and the awards they've won, the achievements, and the high points. But then along with that goes the the other side, the other extreme of the failures, the disappointment. But in terms of pure attention right now, this this, in, this presentness, this attentiveness in the in the Pachubana, the present, there's no memory when you really look at it. A very fleeting, uh, ephemeral, phantom-like thing. There's no. No core to it, no substance. Just comes and goes, like thin air, dissolving into thin air. So, just reflecting the par- the perceptions of time, which we really believe in and op- and live according to, as if time was uh, the ultimate reality. When you examine it. When you really examine time, you see past, the, uh, the past is a memory, it's a perception that arises in the present. And the future is the unknown. So the future, in terms of right now, 
right now we're sitting here in this present moment. Tomorrow, what's that? Tomorrow's a perception of the future, isn't it? Tomorrow, next month, next year. That's what it is in the present, the perception of what we, you know, of potential, of possibility, of the unknown. And so there's a knowing of not knowing. It's not a, this is, I found this very helpful to know not knowing. Whereas sometimes you'd like to know what is really going to happen in the future. What, what about Y2K, Argentinator? Is that really? <laughs> what does the Buddha have to say about Y2K? <laughs> What about the next millennium? What about you know, the future of Buddhism in the United States? What about the future of Spirit Rock? What about the future of the, of the monastic Sangha in the West? Speculate. Some, sometimes it seems pretty good, sometimes it seems like it's not very good. <laughs> Depends on how you want to look at it, whether you're particularly optimistic or pessimistic. But in terms of the reality of it, it is not knowing, isn't it? Don't know. I don't, don't know that. The future is the unknown. Uncertain. So knowing uncertainty, and, and, and we're not demanding certainty anymore. Like, how many of you really want to be sure about everything uh, and be certain and, and have uh, guarantees for everything's going to be all right? What about the American economy? Is there going to be a depression? Is there is the society going to fall apart? As uh, you know, I'd like to know for sure so I can prepare, hoard up food. <laughs> but the, the the thing is, you don't know. That's the this is the direct knowing of not knowing. You can you can hold. Maybe you prefer one thing over another. One, one possibility you might like better than another one. Or somebody asks, what happens when you die? I just made a, what happens when, when, when somebody dies? I don't know. Haven't died. <laughs> death is, is in the future for me, physical death. It's the unknown. So knowing the unknown is the unknown, is direct knowing. You say, what do Buddhists believe about what happens with after death? And, well, I think Buddhists believe, there's some beliefs, you know, reincarnation, rebirth, these kind of things, but that in terms of right now, they, they might, might prefer uh, these kind of Buddhist ideas. But right now, I don't know what happens after death in terms of direct experience, because I haven't experienced physical death. So, so that, that death is for us, physical death is the unknown, isn't it? And that's why it oftentimes is so frightening because you can imagine anything in the unknown. But all of us are going to experience death sometime in the future, aren't we? We're all going to die, so we'll all know when it happens. <laughs> Direct knowing. 
So preparing yourself for direct knowing is, allows you to be with when the body starts, and the time for the body to pack up and die, then you're in the state of knowing rather than say, oh, what's happening to me? And, and wanting, you know, getting terrified and, and overwhelmed because what's happening to you is so you don't know and you're, you're just frightened by the idea of dying. Some people rather live in utter misery than die, wouldn't they? Because at least misery is something you, you, you know, you can get used to misery. At least it's the known. But the unknown, So when you contemplate future as the unknown, it's not knowing. Is this is a valuable state to to treasure? Not knowing. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know all about everything. We're not God that knows everything about everything. So we're not trying to be God and know everything about everything. But we can know this. This is what we definitely can know. And all conditions are impermanent. Sape sankarani ka. So, like memory is impermanent. Sanya anichang. You just chanted. Sanya perception memory is impermanent. That's that not. Don't attach to the idea, but but because you can directly know this. You don't have to believe in impermanence. You, you, you can observe, you can know directly all conditions are impermanent by just watching, by observing the five aggregates. And then you can know not knowing is like this. Insecurity, feeling insecure, not knowing, is like this. When, when you take the word death, just the, that word, uh, and contemplate it, what does it do? You know, what, what is it if you just think the word death right now? So for me, as I've done this many times, uh, it's the word death. And I don't know what it is. I can speculate about it. I can, I can give you descriptions of what other people say it's all about. But in terms of my own direct experience of death, my mind stops. Thinking mind stops. It goes blank. Nonplussed. Thinking does it can't go any further, just death, the unknown. Not knowing is like this, and so reflecting on the state of not knowing. You can feel a, a kind of when you're not used to not knowing, when you always want to know something, then you're then you, you found it very uncomfortable, isn't it? To be in a state of doubt, uncertainty, insecurity, not knowing you you just feel very, uh, I've got to find out. You know, I just feel so ill at ease and uncomfortable and kind of anxious around the, the future or about my death. Uh, and so, because we're not, we're not used to, to uh, we, we don't understand the way it is. We, 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 just, we would like maybe somebody to tell, would you believe what I, t- what I said? You know, if I said, when you die, you're, you're all going to be reborn as angels. Would you believe that? <laughs> if you attend my retreat?
I could probably get quite a following I mean, <laughs> making promises you know, like that about the future. <clears throat> if you attend my retreats, you'll all be reborn as beautiful angels that live 84 million eons in, in unmitigated joy and happiness and beauty. That's, that's very, you know, that can be quite a tempting thing, isn't it? But the fact is you don't know in terms of direct knowing. Death, and that word itself uh, is, a, is a word that the people find quite frightening. Used to be a totally unacceptable word to use, and uh, you know, like talk about it in public. Go to somebody's house and talk about death. It was a, just socially unacceptable, politically incorrect. You talk about well, in the afterlife or passing away, or the ways of talking about death that that doesn't make it sound so stark, so threatening. When my mother died uh, ten years ago, I went to the funeral, a Roman Catholic funeral in San Diego, and said, the priest said, now she is up in heaven with the Lord. And I'm giving this wonderful scenario of my mother now being really happy, getting her, her corporal form and now living up in, in the heavens with God. And, and uh, it all, it was rather nice to think like that. But the reality is nobody knows. Those are, those are rather kind of sentiments that, that make us feel good, but the direct knowing is not knowing. So now we know life, say, we're experiencing life within a sense form. It's like this, isn't it? Consciousness is like this. Rupa, the, the physical body is like this. The breath is like this. Sensitivity, this is a sense realm where we, we feel everything, pleasure, pain, neutral. Vedana, the feeling is like this. You can't just feel good. Sensitivity implies the range uh, from pleasure to pain. So I mean, it, it, I mean, desire wants to just feel good. But the reality of our lives in this realm is pleasure and pain, we have to get both, neutral. This is the way it is. Pleasure and pain, Vedana is impermanent. Anicca, Vedana, Anicca. Sanya, Anicca. Sanya is perception, memory. So, so like if you, you know, you, we, we give names to things. We something arises in consciousness, we want to remember what it is. I remember years ago going to a, a, a museum of modern art and they noticing people standing in front of some modern abstract painting and getting totally frustrated saying, it doesn't make any sense, don't know what it is. And the, and the, the artist didn't give it a name, didn't call it uh, Dawn over San Francisco or anything. It, it was just uh, study number three or something like that. Uh, what is it? I think a child of two could do better than that. <laughs> people getting angry. I mean, if, you, if you could... 
um, you know, at least a child of three or four would make a tree look more like a, he could identify it as a tree usually. Or a house, and that, that, that we can manage, but when it doesn't look like anything that we can, we can say, we can name, then we get frustrated and feel feel very uncomfortable. So we, we want to perceive something as something. We want to know what everything is. You know, this is a clock. This is a bell. What is this thing here? Is it a soup bowl? A punch bowl? <coughs> spittoon, a big spittoon, maybe. <laughs> is it for, is it a, a, for putting waste in? You know, do you, your little uh, Kleenexes and that, you could. Is it for. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, no, that's a bell. And oh, now I know what it is. It's a bell. <laughs> so you see somebody putting their Kleenex in, and you say, you can't do that. <laughs> and they say, why? And it, because that's a bell. <laughs> You can't put used Kleenexes in a bell. <laughs> so this is perception in that sanya, and we've already decided that this is a bell, haven't we? Everybody agrees this is a bell, and I, and I ring it, you know, he's rung the bell. So that's a perception. You you perceive this now as a bell, where. <coughs> say if it were sitting maybe not on such a elegant cushion and just sitting somewhere outside you you might think it's just a for putting a potted plant or something and that it's it's you'd have you the way you perceive it would be could be different if you didn't if nobody told you what it really is now that you know that what this is it's difficult to perceive it as anything else isn't it it would be very difficult now to perceive this as a a planter or a waste receptacle or a spittoon. You know, this is how uh, the sanya kind of fixes everything, and and you get very conditioned by this fixity. You know, this this is a bell, this is a tree, this is a mountain, this is a man, this is a woman. This is right. This is wrong. So, the sanya, uh, say, the ability to perceive something, we attach to that sanya. Attachment to views and perceptions. <coughs> and that though you, you know, like all the ethnic biases are, are based on this, perceiving a, another group as, you know, having a fixed way of perceiving a, another group of people. Without, you know, say you, you, you hear the name of this group and you, you know, oh, they're that way. They are that way. And that's the attachment to Sanya, Sankara, Sankara mental formation. So then the, you say, like you can see, this is a bell. So this is a Japanese bell, and it's a very good bell. It was given by so and so. It costs a lot of money. It has beautiful sound. I like it very much. I would like to take it with me to Amravati. <laughs> 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 well, that, that's, uh, <laughs> so from from bell it goes into you know describing uh, it in uh, how much you like it or don't like it or its history it's all the things around it the proliferating from bell to and then it takes off into other into this proliferation around it. 
So, and that's impermanent, sankara anicca, vinyamang anicchang. So, it's just five, five groups, five aggregates we contemplate in terms of impermanence. The body is impermanent, feelings are impermanent, perceptions are impermanent, mental formations are impermanent, uh, consciousness is impermanent. So contemplating this, it helps to 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 change your attitude rather than than seeing you know fixing on this, uh, thinking you know everything about this because you you have a fixed perception. Then then uh, this kind of changes that you can look at it in different ways. You don't have to perceive everything according to habit. You can, you can look at things in different ways. You see how thick we get in the cultural conditioning. It can really kind of bind us into, it has to be like this or it's not right. <coughs> So then in, in the state of attention, you know, you, you keep, you can reflect on the way it is. And so the sape sankara nicha. Sankara is, is a word meaning like compounded. Uh, it means all that, ar- all that arises ceases. Sankara, all uh, sanya, rupa, vedana, sanya, and vinyana are sankaras. But in, then it's particularly used as a, the fourth uh, kanda. So it, it's used in different ways in the Pali canon. But it, but it is a, it's a kind of generic term for um, conditioned phenomena, sankara, sankaras. All sankaras are impermanent. Then the pe dhamma anada, all dhamma is impermanent. The created is all 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 dhamma is not self, in other words. The pe dhamma anada. <coughs> Notice the difference when dhamma is anatta rather because Dhamma includes the deathless, the created and the uncreated. So in Buddha's teaching, notice that you're, re- you're reflecting on Dhamma, and, and so that this, this relationship of Buddha to Dhamma is important because you're not analyzing yourself anymore. Because when you start, when you start analyzing yourself, that just creates the illusion of self, it perpetuates this, this, I am the five tundras, I am this body, I am these feelings, I am these perceptions, I am these mental formations, this consciousness is me, uh, I am this bundle of problems, I am this, I have these emotions, these are, this is me. And so the, when we see things on the personal level, personality view, then, then we create a world uh, based on this illusion of a kind of permanent self, unique self, where when we see it in terms of Dhamma, then we, we see that the, the, the five khandas are impermanent. We, we, we realize the, the Amata Dhamma, the, the unconditioned reality, which is not 
you know, has no personal, is not mine. Say the unconditioned reality is mine. It's a kind of ridiculous thing to attach to. But there, is, there, there is this deathless reality. It's real. It, to be realized, it has been realized. Like um, last night, Desana on the third noble truth. So the the sense of self is you know, letting go of this the self view when you're taking refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha. So in terms of the third refuge of Sangha, this is an interesting one because like people talk about the Sangha here at Spirit Rock, and then that then because the word is used for the community here or the Vipassana Sangha and so forth, and then that gets in, so the word Sangha is also identified with a lot of personality. You know, the, the Spirit Rock Sangha, and then you think of Jack, you know, and all the, the people here that, that work here as personality. He's like this, he's like that. So the Sangha becomes full of personality. And so is that your refuge? <laughs> You know, to take the refuge in the personalities of Amavati. No, thank you. <laughs> Nightmare scenario. <laughs> so, using the word Sangha as a as, uh, as it's meant to be used, supatipano, ujupatipano, nyanya patipano, samiji patipano, when we chant in the morning, the, the, the patipano is a Pali word for those who, who are putting it into practice, doing it. And uh, it's, not, it's not naming anybody, it's not saying he's a good meditator or she's a good meditator or she's not such a good meditator. Uh, she still has a lot of problems, but she's probably a, a sotapanna. Oh, is, is she a sotapanna? Has anybody verified her stream entry? Well, there's this monk came the other day and he said, she's a sotapanna. Who's he? <laughs> <laughs> is that, was Ajahn Chah an Arahant? What about Ajahn Mahabua in Thailand? Is he an Arhant? Or this is, you know, so we, but it gets into personality again. Person, this person is, this person isn't. So that's not, the, the refuge in Sangha, see, is not taking refuge in, in, in a Sangha, a particular Sangha like Spirit Rock or a, or a monastic sangha, or anything like that, but it's a supatipano, those who practice, who do good, practice in the, in the, to do good, su, supatipano, su, it always means the, the prefix su is always good, means something good, practice goodness. So that doesn't mean it not, we're not looking and judging whether who's practicing goodness or not as, as an individual, but it's it's the kind of lovely thought of all human beings in the world who are practicing goodness is taking refuge in the goodness of of human of humanity. You know, it's not lay, pointing to any particular individual. Stupatipano. But it is talking about human beings. It's not talking about angels that you don't know. You know, supposedly there's angels that are very good and they take refuge in song of angels. But it's 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 bringing attention to to the 
the goodness in humanity, the supatipano, ujapatipano, direct, uh, practice directly. And this, this path, you can see, is very direct. It's here and now. It's not beating around the bush. It's not circumambulating anything. It's right to the very center, isn't it? Now, awareness now, just as direct and as simple as that. Yet we make it very roundabout and complicated, abstruse. I've got to get to this stage. First, I've got to get the jhanas, and then once I get the jhanas, then I get this, and then it says in the book it says like this, and Ajahn Nitsa told me about that, that I have to get fourth jhana or uh, in order to go to vipassana, and then the other Ajahn says, don't get jhanas, go to vipassana, and and pure vipassana, and and then. Uh, Another Ajahn says, well, you have to get at least neighborhood concentration, Tanika Samadhi, in order to do Vipassana. (laughs) (laughs) (coughs) Where the direct is just to see the doubt in them. It's as clear as that. What did I do first? Samatha Vipassana. Just that alone, if you trust yourself, just to recognize a doubt and uncertainty about what you should do. Should I, should I do anapana first or do posture? Should I look at my body first? Or how, f- how long should I do samatha? Should I do it 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Or should I just not do samatha and go right into vipassana? And uh, Ajahn Tamir, what should I do? Should I listen to the sound of silence and not do any anapana sati? And so it's like and the direct thing is this, this, the, the direct path would be to the ujjo patipana, just knowing this, not knowing doubts like this, confusion like this. So you're always you're learning to trust yourself to just observe, to be with what you're feeling, what, what's going on. Physically, mentally, emotionally. The Ujjupatipano. Those who practice directly. And don't take refuge in those who practice indirectly. So, yaya patipano, that's like w- rightly uh, and some easy, like appropriately. These are the sense of directness, of rightness, of suitability. It's just like these, these words are, are pointing to just uh, the ability for a human that we all have to do good, to, 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 do, to live in a way of that's good, to practice what is good, to act on what is good, and then to see directly, rightly, suitably, what is appropriate, what is beautiful. So they say in Sangha, then that, that's our refuge in Sangha, that our humanity and, uh, the, and we see it as a bond with all human beings, in a way, whether they're Buddhists or even if they're criminals. They're, we're not taking refuge in their criminality, but in their potential goodness. So it's, li- it's like, a, uh, you know, the, this, it's not, not pointing to this, this particular ajahn or this particular teacher as a refuge. So, Sangha as a refuge, is to reflect on it and make it, you know, see it not, not as a, uh, because it can get a 
if you you know if you start criticizing the the sangha here at Spirit Rock, after a while the word sangha becomes a word that kind of brings dread into your mind. In, in, in the UK, we have, in Europe, we have the, it's called the Council of Elders. Or the Elders' Council. And this council can be pretty, pretty difficult sometimes. So for a while, I, every time they say, we're having a meeting of the elders, I feel a pit in my stomach, something start kind of tightening up. The elders, and they, ooh. Because I was seeing it in terms of of personalities, wasn't it? Personalities, identifying the word elders, council of elders, with personalities. So this is this is a way to use language and to use it for reflection, and and also to to develop uh, a, a sense for how to use how to use these terms skillfully. Because we can we can just bring in all these poly words into the English language, and 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 it just becomes jargon, and it just become vipassana jargon, or you know like computer jargon and all that. You just you get into the Western Buddhist world, and it's and it's full of of jargon, and and so the oftentimes the words that have pri- uh, you know aren't meant to be uh, jargon become that way because of just perfunctory usage and not really examining and knowing the the true meaning. So like this, reflecting is. Is your ability to say, make these things come alive for you, make them work, so they aren't just, so it doesn't just become uh, Buddhist jargon.
with the sound of silence, you see, let things dissolve into it. So, like, if you can appreciate that, it's like emotional feelings and and uh, thoughts move very quickly. You begin to really can can see that the thought is very fast and thinking is a very fast thing. But what but it also thinking brings up emotion or mood. So in, in uh, contemplating the, the citta or the mood of the mind, the state of mind, in this silence, because it, the silence embraces your mood. And you, can, you can settle, you can rest in the silence and, and, and feel the, the mood you're in. And, it, and just by Letting it be the way it is, letting the mood that you have be this way as feeling. You don't don't figure it. Don't you know, I don't analyze why. Why do I feel this way? And then you start thinking again. And just stop thinking with the sound of silence. Stop thinking. Feel this in the silence of your mind till it. And then it starts fading out, drops away. And then notice it's absent. What was once maybe a strong emotional feeling is, where did it go? So like if you're feeling angry, go to the, the feeling of anger. Say in your, you can like feel it in your, in your body. Or just a, a mental kind of mood, a kind of, mental state that you, you notice in the silence it dissolves and then notice non-anger is like this so anger you know anger is like this feeling of anger when it's when it when it when it's gone then mentally note non-anger is like this so you're kind of really Using this, uh, you know, no- noticing, paying attention to the way it is. So you know, anger and non-anger. So one goes to the other. You begin to, 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 to really, you know, inform your conscious experience in life. You know, it was wisdom. You're informing. You're using wisdom with consciousness. Like we're conscious, even even a totally crazy person conscious. So you can be totally elude, deluded and uh, messed up and still be conscious as consciousness isn't, you know, isn't wisdom. So now you're using wisdom, you're informing con- your conscious experience with wisdom. And this is how to do it. So you know it. So if you anger, if, you, if somebody makes you angry, then you can actually use that anger to realize non-anger. That you really see that it's all, you, you're using what the way it is, you're, you're developing wisdom around the, the presence of this and the absence of this. And what remains is, a, is, a, is an awareness, a pure state of awareness. It isn't, that doesn't, uh, that isn't angry or non angry. It's a knowing, it's a, a state of knowing. An actual state of uh, attentive awareness, wisdom. Mm-hmm.